Seeker, written by Susanna Thompson, performed by Heather Firth. Chapter 40 God has healed Justin. That is the only explanation for his remarkably lucid condition. The doctors thought that he would have brain damage, but my brother is completely himself. Mom is laughing through tears of happiness as she tells me how the first words he spoke were, where's my phone? He then panicked and asked her if he broke anything. She had to keep him from getting out of bed before the staff could examine him. When she pushed the button for the nurse, she also called me, thinking that I was with dad. I immediately called him when I hung up with mom to tell him that Justin was awake. What time is it? Justin had demanded in the meantime. When can I get out of here? And where's my phone? Did I drop it in the snow? The nurse had asked him if he knew his name, and he had impatiently answered that it was Justin. Albrecht, he replied when she quizzed him on his last name. After answering questions on what year it was and who our president is, he had remarked sarcastically that he thought he was in a hospital, not school. Then he accusingly asked the nurse if she had hidden his phone so he couldn't look up any answers. Justin is scowling while mom tells me this story. He had rolled his eyes during my emotional response to seeing him awake, apparently having no idea how bad his condition had been. Even his face has regained its healthy color. If it wasn't for the bandages around his head, I wouldn't be able to tell that he had been injured. I lost my phone, he complains. Somebody probably took it by now. We'll get you a new phone, Mom consoles him. The phone can be replaced, she adds, with a tearful look at him that says he can't. Justin's scowl deepens. I need my phone. I'll go buy you one tomorrow as soon as the store opens, Mom promises him. He is obviously not appeased by that assurance, so I reassure him that nobody else can use his phone if they don't know his password. Mom adds that she'll also cancel the service to his phone. I'll lose all my contacts, he says, revealing why he's so upset. We can retrieve your contacts from the website, Mom tells him. His demeanor immediately brightens. You can? I'm struck with a surreal realization that we're discussing cell phones with someone who was in a critical coma only a short time ago. Thank God, I exclaim gratefully. Justin looks at me like I've lost my mind. What do you care about my contacts? I laugh as tears begin to stream down my face. Thank you, God, for giving me my brother back. Justin appears uncomfortable with my heartfelt prayer of thanks, but I speak to him intently. You should thank God, too. The doctor said that you would be brain damaged. Mila, Mom chides me. Don't scare him. He should know, I insist. He should know what God did for him. Brain damaged? Justin questions with a wide-eyed look. They were worried that you might be, Mom explains, trying to soften the truth. They weren't just worried, I contradict her. They told you he would most likely have brain damage. I repeat the words Dad had spoken in despair. Dad said that it would be weeks before he came out of his coma, and he came out of it in one day, and he's not brain damaged. You said yourself that it was a miracle. It is, she agrees. Justin is looking shaken up by this information, but I feel that it's important for him to know how God saved him. He wouldn't even remember having a phone, let alone know how to use it if God hadn't healed his brain. There was no doubt that Justin had suffered a serious injury. I remember the surgeon's grim expression before my parents went to speak with him in private, I wonder how much they hadn't told me about their conversation with him. It had probably been worse than I knew. We all prayed for you, 
I tell Justin. Silas even had everybody at the Bible college praying for you. Well, thanks, he responds awkwardly. Justin. Mom and I turn as Dad rushes into the room. He must have broken at every speed limit to get here so fast. Justin greets him with a casual, hey, Dad. I don't remember ever seeing my dad cry before, but the tears are spilling unchecked down his face now. Justin, he exclaims again, my boy. He springs forward, but halts in hesitation by Justin's bedside like he's afraid to touch him. He settles for placing his hand on Justin's shoulder. My brother is clearly uncomfortable with dad's display of emotion. I'm okay, he assures him. Thank God, dad says. I think about how often we say that when we are relieved about something. Many of us say it automatically, without even thinking about the words we are speaking. In that moment, I vow to consciously thank God for all the good in my life. I silently thank him again for answering my family's prayers. So, Justin begins after a few seconds of silence, Mom said that I can get a new phone tomorrow. Mom and I laugh, but Dad still looks choked up. You can get anything you want, he promises. Ask for one for me, too, I joke. I'm only kidding, but Mom speaks seriously to me. We'll never take away your phone again. I'm so sorry, Mila. We had no way to reach you. Justin could have. She stops without saying the word. But I know she's telling me that Justin could have died. He could have died before I even knew that he'd been injured. I realize that all those messages on our answering machine were probably from Mom. And I wonder how long she had been trying to call me. I might have still been at the bridal shop when she made the first call. In that moment, I decide that I'm done with hiding things from my parents. Justin's life and death ordeal has put things in perspective for me. Keeping secrets from my parents seems like a hindrance now rather than a help. It no longer feels wise to lie to them about where I'm going when I leave the house. They should know where I am when they need to reach me. I found a wedding dress, I tell them. That's where I was today. I lied to you about looking for a job, but I won't lie to you again. It's okay, Mom says. Everything's okay now. It is? I question. You're okay with me getting married? Mila, Mom begins. I know you had fun trying on wedding dresses, and I understand your excitement over the wedding. I'll help you plan everything. All we're asking you do is to just postpone it until you graduate. Dad gives her a questioning look, and she smiles reassuringly at him. It takes a year to plan a wedding, she continues speaking to me. It's your dream day, so it should be perfect. We'll find the best location for the reception and find a good photographer. There's the wedding cake to pick out and the invitation and bridesmaid dresses. I know that she's dangling all these lovely things in front of me to get me to postpone getting married. Shelby is my bridesmaid, I reply. We already found a dress for her, too. But I didn't think to call her when all this happened. The only person I called was Silas, and he came right away to pray with me. He's still here, and we were praying when you called to tell me that Justin was okay. I don't need a big wedding, I continue. The only thing I need to get married is Silas. I'd like to have my family there, too, I add. After everything that's happened, it would be wonderful for all of us to be together. There's no need to decide anything now, Mom stalls. Silas has shown that he cares about you, she concedes. We were too harsh on him. You don't have to break up and you're not grounded anymore. Thanks, I say, letting the conversation drop for now. I've made my decision so there is no reason for me to argue. 
The most important thing is that Justin is okay. My love life is not my priority right now. Ironically, Justin has made his own love life a new priority for himself. He tells me about it when mom and dad go to get him the coke he requested. I'm thinking they both went so they could have their own private conversation. I met a girl, Justin confides after they leave the room. Her name is Nora. Isn't that a cool name? Is it a nickname for Nora? I inquire, earning a frown from Justin. It's Nor, he repeats, clearly liking that version of her name better. She is an awesome snowboarder, better than me, he admits. Is that why you got hurt? I demand. Were you trying to impress her? No, he denies. I was just practicing some stuff I saw her do. Good thing she wasn't there to see me fall. You could have been killed doing stupid stunts. I admonish him. You have to be more careful. I'm fine, he answers carelessly, already dismissing his serious injury. At least I still have her number. That's why you were so worried about your phone, I realize. Huh, you really like this girl. It's strange to think of my little brother having a crush on a girl. But he is 13, which makes him a teenager. It's hard to wrap my head around that, because he's still a kid to me. Justin makes no comment on my observation regarding his feelings for the girl he met. He's apparently reached his limit of confiding in me. Are you really getting married? He questions me instead. Yes, I confirm. Wow, he says. That's weird. His use of that word triggers in me a desire to tell him the truth about how I met Silas. Have you ever heard about death? I ask. Like the guy in stories that's death. The guy in the black robe that has the scythe? He inquires. Yeah, I reply. Except they don't look like that. They're like regular guys, but their faces are like robots. No expression and, wait, scythe? I backtrack. How do you know that word? He rolls his eyes at me before shrugging when he can't pinpoint the source of his knowledge. I've heard it before. It's a weapon with a blade. Yeah, I agree. Curved. Anyway, they don't carry that. What movie is that from? Justin interrupts before I can continue. It's not a movie. It's actually... I cut my sentence off abruptly as mom and dad re-enter the room. Justin is distracted by the coke they have brought him. And the moment has passed by the time he quenches his thirst and remembers our conversation. What's it from? He prompts. I try to wave off his question dismissively. But mom asks what we're talking about. Death looking like a robot guy? Justin answers her. Where'd you see that, Mila? He pesters me. It was something I read in a book. I lie. Justin loses interest when he hears it's a book. But mom's displeased expression when she looks at me tells me that she doesn't appreciate my topic of conversation. You should go home, she advises me. Justin needs his rest. I'm not tired, he insists. Your mother's right, Dad says. We'll come back in the morning. Mom picks up a bag of clothes crowding a small table. Take these home with you. I wish I had my phone, Justin grumbles. It's boring here, Dad laughs. You've only been awake for an hour. We'll get you a new phone tomorrow, Mom soothes Justin. Can I go home tomorrow? He asks. I don't think so, bud. Dad tells him. You just had surgery. Mom hurries to lessen Justin's disappointment. We'll see what the doctor says. Dad and I encounter Silas waiting for us down the hallway. It's time to go get some rest. Dad remarks to him. Do you need a ride to your hotel? 
No, sir, Silas replies. I have my car. I'll reimburse you for the cost of your room. Dad promises him. Thank you for driving down here and for your prayers. That's not necessary, sir, Silas assures him. I can pay for the room myself. How is Justin? He's okay. He's miraculously okay, I exclaim. God answered our prayers. Praise God, Silas exclaims in return. The elevator door opens and dad ushers us inside. He is holding onto Justin's bag of clothes with his other hand. They have been stuffed inside the clear plastic bag, with his jacket being shoved into the bottom and the rest of the clothes being piled on top. I decide to take them out of the bag after we get home, so that I can hang his jacket on a chair so it won't remain wrinkled at the bottom of the bag. I gasp and stare in horror at all the dark blood stains on the jacket. I'm hit again by the realization of how serious his injury was. Head injuries bleed a lot, Dad says, reminding me that he's standing right beside me. It often looks worse than it is. My voice carries the weight of my words when I speak. Not this time. No, Dad agrees. It was bad, really bad. They told us. What? I question insistently when he trails off. What did they tell you? His gaze is haunted as he speaks. They said he might not make it. But even if he did, he would be severely brain damaged. The horror of the bloodstains is replaced by the horror of imagining my brother having severe brain damage and not understanding anything that was going on around him. Would he even have had an inkling of who we were? No, he wouldn't have even known who he was or even had the capacity to realize that he didn't know. He probably wouldn't have been able to form words either, and he would never have been able to talk to us again. His personality, everything that made him who he was, would have been gone. I sink down to my knees, overwhelmed and profoundly grateful to God for what he has done for Justin. There is nothing more that I could ever ask of him than the miracle we have been granted.